Okay, can you? I hope you can hear it also. Anybody read about Hezekiah lately? Amazing. Amazing king. It's amazing that he came from, uh, that king came from the father <laughs> who was king before him. God does some amazing things. We're looking at uh, 2 Kings chapter 18 through 20, parts of it. Hezekiah is going to show us this morning five things that can help us in our lives. I hope at least one of those will be of particular help to you. I don't know which one that is. I hope the, the light will come on and say, man, I can really use that. I'm going to write that down. I'm going to uh, have John uh, email me a copy of his notes or whatever it takes, or I'll go on the church website and um, watch that again. Maybe I'll catch something that I didn't hear the first time. 2 Kings chapter 18, verses 1 through 5. See if we can find that here. Is that big enough for you to see? Pardon me, I have some strange... Uh, <laughs> strange differences in font. Uh, if all else fails, get out the good book. Large print. It came about in the third year of Hosea, the son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah, became king. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Abby, the daughter of Zechariah. I think that might be the key right there. How, do, how does a person get to be a great person if your dad's a bad man? <laughs> well, look no further. Uh, must have been a good lady. He did right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father David had done. He removed the high places and broke down the sacred pillars and cut down the Asherah. He also broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the son of Israel burned incense to it, and it was called Nehushtan. He trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that after him there was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor among those who were before him. For he clung to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. Something we can learn from Hezekiah. Purify your faith. Did you catch all the stuff that Hezekiah did? It kind of goes in a in quick order there. Uh, it's good to ask ourselves as we read our Bibles, what does that what does that mean? What does it mean when he says he removed the high places? Didn't they worship God there? Sometimes. <laughs> you know, when things went really well, people worshipped God on the high places. And when things were going badly, they worshipped Baal on the high places. But where were they supposed to worship? At the temple. They're supposed to get together with other, other people of God's people, and, he, and there was very specific things to do, things to celebrate, sacrifices to bring, offerings to make. God never said, uh, you know, go out here and worship wherever you feel like. And so, who was in charge at the high places? <laughs> That's a good question, isn't it? If the priests are at the temple, who, who's in charge at the high places? A, a, an amateur priest? Somebody who's spiritual? Whatever that means? I don't know. It was kind of like, do it how you want. I can go worship God under a tree. You ever hear that one before? 
Well, you certainly can, but don't let that be any kind of a... You should worship God wherever you go. Okay? You should worship God and express your worship in the way you live. But don't let that take the place of what God has told us to do. This is how I want you to come to me. See? So, uh, it was mostly bad that happened at the high places. So what did he do? He removed them. The pillars. He, uh, he broke down this... My Bible has uh, uh, italics. It says sacred pillars. That's at, He broke down the pillars. They weren't sacred at all <laughs> by biblical standards, but they were, they were some kind of... Was the pillars of Baal? Now, Asherah is mentioned specifically after that, but these were, what were they, totem poles? You know, that's what totem poles are. They're images of gods, of somebody's gods. These, these were objects of worship. He broke them down. And he cut down the Asherah. Reminds you of the Gideon, doesn't it? Gideon, Gideon worshiped God. He believed in God. And uh, God said, I want you to go to your father's house, to, to your father's own private little shrine and cut down the Asherah, knock down the temple of Baal at your father's house. And he did it. He did it by night, but he did it. <laughs> that's what counts. You know, that's, that's what Hezekiah was doing here. He was chopping down. Was anybody offended by these things, you think? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. He's the king, but uh, I could still hate him. I could still make plans and murder him, maybe. Um, and he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had. Moses made an idol, right? And they had been... No, no, he didn't. <laughs> this was God's solution for a plague of of poisonous serpents that God had sent to get his people's attention to stop sinning. And so they made a bronze serpent. Remember the one, ever see the AMA, um, American Medical Association logo? Well, that's what that is, a serpent on a pole, okay? Uh, well, somehow they had, kept, they had kept that serpent, that image of a serpent, these hundreds of years, and somehow it got around to, I'm going to, I'm going to offer a, an incense sacrifice to this serpent that saved them. No, it wasn't. God saved them. He said, if you look at the serpent, you'll live. They did. That's how they stopped the plague. But God did it. Now they're, they've debased themselves and lowered themselves. We're worshiping the serpent. We're burning incense to it. He took it out, crushed it up, broke it in pieces, and took it to Wes's work and they recycled it. <laughs> okay? That's all it was good for. Not like Moses. It didn't do quite like Moses. Moses ground up the golden cows and made him drink the water. <laughs> Put it in the water and nobody bur he broke it up. You're not going to do this anymore. This is startling what Hezekiah is doing. How did he know to do that? How did he... How did he arrive at the decision? This is this is how we're going to do it here. I'm I'm in charge, and this is this is how we're going to worship. First of all, we we just put it like this, and we can do this the same thing that same thing that Hezekiah did. Take out the trash. Sometimes that's what we have to do before we can go anywhere. First, you have to take out the trash, dump the garbage. That's what he was doing. We, we can't really go forward in being God's people until we get rid of the stuff that is contrary. It's, pro, it's prohibited of God's people. We're going to stop doing those things. And so here, here's Hezekiah, and that's what he did. And so this took a lot of trust because there were people who trusted in all these things. Hezekiah said, I'm, I'm going to trust God. We don't, we don't need the updated version. We don't need the newest thing. We don't need what the neighbors are doing over there in that other country. 
We need to do what God said. Just do it the way he said. And, and that will be enough. That will be the right thing to do. Okay, so he took out the trash. The, the corruption, some of these things were, were uh, just vague facsimiles of the way God told them to do it. Some were just blatant substitutions. Okay, we can take out the trash too. Trust God and do it the way he says. This means, uh, this was a, a purification. And all these things had to do with belief. This was not some other, you know, people just going out sinning. This was the way that they worshipped God had been corrupted. It's hard, it's hard to please God when you don't even worship him the way he wants to be worshipped. Okay, so these were matters of faith uh, to many people. And, and, but to, to Hezekiah, they were matters of, uh, they were abhorrent. They were abominations. That's because that's what God said. Trust God. Number two, something else Hezekiah did. Encounter the enemy. This is chapter, uh, chapter 18, verses 7 and 8. And the Lord was with him. He had just done all these things. The Lord was with him. There's a connection there. Wherever he went, he prospered. And so what did he do? First, he rebelled against the king of Syria and did not serve him. These were, these were the neighbors to the north, east. Uh, he rebelled against them. That means I'm not going to participate. I'm not going to be uh, your lieutenant. I'm not going to pay you money for any kind of... A, I'm not going to buy a piece with you. He rebelled against them. And he defeated the Philistines as far as Gaza and its territory from watchtower to fortified city. So A, he refused tribute to Assyria. This is that, this juggernaut, this, this unstoppable power that was coming closer, closer and closer to him. And he roundly thrashed the Philistines. This was their, the local threat. The, the, how long had the, had the Israelites been fighting the Philistines? That's how this whole thing of king starts, isn't it? We have Saul and Jonathan leading Israel and, and Samuel, transitioning from Samuel, the last judge, and what's the problem? The problem is the Philistines, isn't it? Their neighbors... And to the point where it says there was no sword in Israel. They went to fight the Philistines. All they had was hoes, <laughs> pruning shears, pitchfork. We're going we're gonna to charge armed soldiers with a pitchfork. Okay? They were totally dominated. And off and on, of course, David's great battles were against the Philistines, among others. Goliath was a Philistine. And so on. And here we have, it must still be a problem. He said, we're going we're gonna to finish, we're going to mop this up, okay? We're not going to fight these guys anymore. We're going to finish them. So they defeated them from watchtower, from the outpost, all the way right up to their doorsteps and conquered them. That's a great thing Hezekiah did. He encountered the enemy. Then... Ten years go by. Things are going pretty well. He did a lot of things. He did a lot of infrastructure. He improved his country. He, he made things prosperous for the citizens. But we, we, we find a problem here. Verse 13. Now in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and seized them. What had he been doing in the meantime? He had been wiping out their cousins, their brothers, uh, the ten tribes of Israel to the north, who were, if you can imagine, they were even more disobedient, usually, than the tribe of Judah. And he had been 
systematically destroying it. He, he besieged Samaria. He carried off thousands of people from the northern tribes of Israel. And he relocated them in other places, other remote locations. And he brought those people back to live in the territory of Israel. Now there's foreigners living there. And uh, it, it hasn't escaped <coughs> hasn't escaped the notice of Sennacherib. Hey, um, these guys quit paying their hush money about 10 years ago. They're going to get theirs. Yeah, we haven't forgot about it. We're, we're, we're working our way there. Okay? So in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib came up against all the fortified cities of Judah. Where are the fortified cities? Well, that's the forts. That's the outlying cities on the border that they have fortified to resist invasion of their enemies. What did he do? He knocked them down. He defeated them. He broke into them. They're gone. So what kind of case is, is Jerusalem in now? The, the highway is open. There, there's no resistance. There's nobody left. Nothing between Sennacherib and Jerusalem. This is our point, though. Don't compromise. <coughs> what did Hezekiah do? Verse 14, Then Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria at Lachish, one of the Philistine city, formerly Philistine cities, I believe, saying, I have done wrong. Withdraw from me. Whatever you impose on me, I will bear. So the king of Assyria required of Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. I'm just going by memory. I think a talent was around 75 pounds. But there's different, different measures. It was a significant amount of, of weight. A talent was a weight, okay? This is a, this is a fortune, a treasure that the king says, okay, pay me this much. Hezekiah gave him all the silver which was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasuries of the king's house. At that time, Hezekiah cut off the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord and from the doorposts which Hezekiah, king of Judah, had overlaid and gave it to the king of Assyria. Then the king of Assyria sent Tartan and Rabsaris and Rabshakeh from Lachish to King Hezekiah with a large army to Jerusalem. You know, we need to not second guess ourselves. We need to not give in. It has no value. Compromise with the enemy has no value. You understand that? Hezekiah had not done wrong. <laughs> he, he, he says, uh, Sennacherib, I've done wrong. No, he hadn't. He had done right. He had done right to trust in God and quit trying to buy peace with his enemies. He was just intimidated, apparently, by the destruction which they had seen. They've been hearing reports, you know. It's coming closer and closer. Now our border is devastated. He sends and says, I've done wrong. I'll, I'll pay the tribute. King says, okay, give me this much. What's the next thing the king of Assyria did? He sent an army to the gates of Jerusalem. How much did his compromise buy? How much did his tribute buy? Nothing at all. <laughs> he said, thank you very much. Appreciate that treasure. Now that you have desecrated and, and made, a, made a mess of God's temple, uh, now that you've done that, thank you. And now we're coming to get the rest. <laughs> okay. That's what compromise with the enemy does. You know, uh, 
Hezekiah paid the tribute and, and the and the back taxes and the and everything that was in arrears and the interest. He took those precious adornments that he he himself had donated and, and given to God and to adorn the temple, the doors of the temple, the gateposts, and, and so they took uh, cutting torches and tin snips. And they cut all that stuff off and balled it up and put it in ox carts and sent it over to this guy. Now it's just metal scrap. Very valuable metal scrap, but these had been expressions of worship, of devotion to God, to make God's temple glorious, okay? Remember, the temple at this time is a physical place. It's where God says, I'm going to live there. Hezekiah had said, I want this place to be glorious and glorify God. Now he cuts it all off and, and, and gives it away. What's the result? Well, there's an army now at the gate. They're ready to complete, to, to continue this conquest which was, had been completed in Samaria, the capital of Israel and the border outposts of Judah. So this devastation of God's house had really zero value. Sennacherib was going to take it all anyway. The, the treasures, the land, the people, their freedom, their faith, all of it. So compromising with evil really has zero value. But if you want to compromise with evil, the servants of Satan will only laugh at you. They will only say, well, see, look, ah, she's weak. Okay? That's why she compromised with me. She's giving in. As you betray your faith, your family, your people, your brothers and sisters, your own future, don't do it. Well, things got kind of ugly here, didn't they? But, yeah, something we can learn from this idea of not compromising. It, it's not our call. We don't really have the option. Um, you know, if, if we serve the Lord, if he's the captain, uh, who makes the decision if we're going to put out the white flag? Captain. The soldiers don't just, just say, you know what, let's just give, let's try out the white flag. No, they don't do that. The general said, okay, we're, we're going to surrender. That's not the soldier's prerogative. And that's not ours either. It's not our prerogative as servants of Jesus Christ to say, you know, I, I think we're going to give in here. No. No, he's in charge. And it, it really wasn't, uh, what did Hezekiah do? Did he repossess <laughs> the gold that he had donated to God? How did God feel about him ripping the stuff off the temple that, that Hezekiah had donated? Wait, wait, <laughs> I'm repossessing it. That's, that, that was really mine. I'm giving it to these guys. No, that was God's. Okay? You know, if our lives belong to Jesus, it's not really our call to say, let, 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 let's, let's, meet, let's meet the enemy halfway. No, it's not. And, and there's zero value for your trouble. His sacrifice bought nothing at all. It was wasted. The army would have come if he kept it there or if he sent it in the ox cart. It was the same result, right? Okay, a Compromise on our part with Satan it has no value. Okay, here's where it really gets interesting. Refer objections to the complaint desk. It's pretty obvious that, that a, a, an international emperor was not really going to be too happy with Hezekiah. It says now in the... Um, um, there we go. Verse 28. He, the, King Sennacherib did not come himself at this time. He sent his lieutenant. He sent some of his officials. One was named Rabshakeh, and he was a master. He was a master propagandist, a master psychologist, he really knew what he was doing when it came to intimidation. 
This man came to Jerusalem. The gates were locked. And, you know, you can get pretty bold when you have 185,000 soldiers behind you, can't you? Get pretty arrogant. That's what he had. There was a big army. And they're camped right down the road. So he stood and cried with a loud voice in Judea, saying, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, Do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he is not able to deliver you from my hand. Nor let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us, and this city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah. Got to catch up here. Do not listen to Hezekiah, for thus says the king of Assyria. Make your peace with me, and come out to me, and eat each of his vine, and each of his fig tree, and drink each of the waters of his own cistern, until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of grain and new wine. A land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive trees and honey, that you may live and not die. Can't even read my my monitor. But do not listen to Hezekiah when he misleads you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. Has any one of the gods of the nations delivered his land from the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath? And Arpad, where are the gods of Sepharvaim, Hena, and Eba? Have they delivered Samaria from my hand? Who among all the gods of the lands have delivered their land from my hand? That the Lord, that is Jehovah, should deliver Jerusalem from my hand. Well, there's a lot packed into this, isn't there? There's a lot packed into it. First, a a beautiful, wonderful offer. Well, that's too far. Um, Just come out to me. Who is he speaking to? Is he speaking to Hezekiah? No, he's speaking to all the people. In fact, they told him, "Uh, we understand your language. Why don't you speak in your language? He says, no, I want everybody to hear this. Come out to me. Hezekiah can't save you. Jehovah can't save you. Did anybody else's God save him? No. Those places are a shambles. Those people are prisoners. Just come out and you're going to get to go to a wonderful land. You'll be slaves. He didn't mention this. (laughs) You will be slaves. That grain will be cut by you for somebody else. Okay. Uh, That new wine will be harvested by you, but somebody else is going to drink it. But he sure paints a wonderful picture, doesn't he? This is going to be great. Come on out. And you can stay here until we transport you away in chains. Okay? <laughs> this guy is a master. Really a master. But the thing he does that, that's the most... Uh, it's kind of logical, but it's pretty tricky. He says, uh, well, I'm, I'm 10 for 10 against all the other gods. What's the chance of your God saving you? I have a perfect record. None of them's beaten me yet. They were supposedly great. They were supposedly alive. They were supposedly powerful. Where's Samaria today? It's populated by foreigners, and those people are gone. Okay, so just give up now. (laughs) See, this guy's pretty slick, pretty smooth, pretty persuasive. What did Hezekiah do about this? Well, he did what our point is here. He referred objections to the complaint desk. What did he do? First, he went to the prophet. This is chapter 19, 1 through 4. When King Hezekiah heard it, he tore his clothes. That's a sign of of grief, uh, of distress. He covered himself with sackcloth. Humility, and he entered the house of the Lord. Then he sent Eliakim, who was over the household, 
with Shebna the scribe and the elders of the priests covered with sackcloth to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. They said to him, Thus says Hezekiah, This is a day of distress, rebuke, and rejection. For the children, for children have come to birth, and there is no strength to deliver. Perhaps the Lord your God will hear all the words of Rabshakeh, whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to reproach the living God and will rebuke the words which the Lord your God has heard. Therefore offer a prayer for the remnant that is left. Hezekiah went to the prophet. He went, he went for support from God's representative, from God's, God's man. And lo and behold, uh, the threats continue. Okay? Chapter 19. Verses 8 through 13. Then Rabshakeh returned and found the king of Assyria fighting against Libna, for he heard that the king had left Lachish. Well, I'm behind here, sorry. Those are more readable. He returned and found the king of Assyria fighting against Libna. Uh, the headquarters had moved. And uh, when he heard them say concerning Terhaka, king of Cush, behold, he has come out to fight against you, he sent mem messengers again to Hezekiah, saying, Thus you shall say to, king, to Hezekiah, king of Judah, Do not let your God, whom you trust, deceive you, saying, Jerusalem will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Behold, you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the lands, destroying them completely. So will you be spared? <clears throat> Did the gods of these nations which my fathers destroyed deliver them, even Gosan and Haran and Rezeph and the sons of Eden who were in Telassar? Where is the king of Hamath, the king of Arpad, the king of the city of Sepharvaim and of Hena and Eva. So he kind of repeats himself. But this is in a letter now, it said, we find out. And uh, it's put in writing. But he says, you're not getting off, we're busy. Uh, yes, there's been some rumors of trouble on another border, but just because we're going away right now, don't think you got them. You're not going to escape. Even if it's not right now, you'll get yours, okay? What did Hezekiah do? First he had gone, he sent messengers to Isaiah. He consulted, he, he leaned on Isaiah for support, and God said, um, don't worry about it. He's not going to do anything, okay? So now what happens? He goes and takes this letter this written threat, this written insult to Jehovah. And verse 14 of chapter 19, Then Hezekiah took the letter from the hand of the messengers, and he read it. And he went up to the house of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. Did God know what was on that? Well, sure he did. <laughs> but there's something powerful. He just, he just said, but God, look at this. Look at it. Look what they sent me. What do you think of this? He spread it out before the Lord. Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord, God of Israel, who are enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone. Of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see and listen to the words of Sennacherib, which is sent to reproach the living God. And he goes on to say, you know, uh, God deliver us from these people. It says, then Isaiah chapter 20 
son of Amoz, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Because you have prayed to me about Sennacherib, king of Assyria, I have heard you. You know, isn't there a lesson for us here? This would be worth putting a star by in your Bible, if you believe in such things. Underline, out, outline it in pink. Because you have prayed to me. See the difference there? You didn't... Uh, there's no more tribute. No more treaties. No hiring 20,000 mercenary soldiers from the neighbors, which was a common practice. No vassal state. You know, the offer had been, we didn't read it, but the offer had been from, from uh, Sennacherib. Uh, here, I'll make a deal with you. I'll give you 2,000 chariots if you, can, if, you have, uh, if you have some guys that can drive them. And you will serve me. You'll be, you'll be part of the machine. Kind of like, uh, kind of like Mussolini joining in with Hitler, that kind of a thing. You, you can, you can be on the winning side. We're going to conquer the world. Okay, that had been the offer. <coughs> but no, I'm not going to be one. I'm not going to be a puppet king. I'm not going to do that. All he did was just say, God, they're insulting you. They're equating you to these statues of Baal and. Moloch and Dagon and, and, and all the rest. Show them, God, that you are almighty, that you're alive, that you're awesome. Save us! Okay, that was his prayer. God says, because you prayed to me, I have heard you. Wouldn't that help us a lot? Instead of trying to, instead of trying to jockey things around to, to not get in trouble for being a Christian, Go to God. Say, God, here's the situation. You know it. <laughs> but, you know, we need to elaborate those things to God, don't we, and say this. Take note. The apostle said it in the New Testament. God, take note of their threats. Of course God had heard it. But it, he, he wants to hear it from us. God, here's the situation. I'm threatened. So Isaiah sent that to him. And he has a message, even for Sennacherib, this is uh, verse 28, he says, Because of your raging against me, because of your arrogance has come up to my ears, therefore I will put my hook in your nose and my bridle, the bit, in your lips, and I will turn you back by the way which you can. That's what God said. This is part of his, his answer to, to Hezekiah. This is, this is what I'm, this is my message to Sennacherib. You're not coming here. You can't come into Jerusalem. You might have knocked down the forts. You might have uh, wrecked all the defenses, but you're not going to break into that city. That's, that's my place. So what happened after that? Then it happened that night that the angel of the Lord went out and struck 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when, Mo when men rose early in the morning, behold, all of them were dead. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and returned home and lived at Nineveh. Ironic side note, he was, uh, yeah, there it is. It came about as he was worshiping in the house of Nisroch, his god, that Adramelech and Sherezer killed him with the sword, and they escaped into the land of Ararat. And Esarhaddon, and his son, became king in his place. He got sent home. This is the this is the mighty emperor, Sennacherib. He goes home. What did he learn from? 185,000 soldiers dead when he threatened Jehovah. Well, he didn't learn anything. He said, I'm going to still worship my God. And lo and behold, while he is going about that, he's murdered by some of his own people. What, a, what an ignominious 
shameful, unfortunate end of a great, a leader of a great nation and, and country. Uh, it all ended. One more lesson from Hezekiah. This is chapter 20, verses 1 through 3. In those days, Hezekiah became mortally ill, and Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord, saying, Remember, me, remember now, O Lord, I beseech you, how I have walked before you, in truth and with a whole heart and have done what is good in your sight and Hezekiah wept bitterly you know that's a, that's a terrible thing but you know when we face that it, it, it's upsetting how old was Hezekiah at this time well he's 25 plus 14 how old is he the big three nine. Are we supposed to die at 39? Well, no, not in our minds. But he's ill. He's very ill. God says you're going to die. Set your house in order. Do your papers. Uh, who's going to succeed you? And so on. Do your business. What did he do? He says, God, <laughs> wait a minute. Is this what I get for serving you? Uh, this doesn't seem right. You know, he appealed. He appealed to God who is really more than fair. He knew that. He knew God is a just God, and he's beyond just. He's merciful. So he said, I'm going to talk to God about it. Before Isaiah had gone out of the middle court, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Return and say to Hezekiah, the leader of my people, Thus says the Lord, the God of your father David, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Behold, I will heal you. On the third day you shall go up to the house of the Lord. You're going to be out and about in three days. I will add 15 years to your life and I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria and I will defend this city for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. Then Isaiah said, take a cake of figs and they took and laid it on the boil and he recovered. Then we need to pray first, not, not the last resort. Don't we do that sometimes? Boy, I'm sick. I gotta see a doctor. <laughs> why, don't we, why don't we pray first? Ask God. That's what he did. Yeah, there, there's doctors. There's all kinds of things we can do. But pray first. You know, Hezekiah seemed to think it was unfair. Did he have a case? It seems that God thought so. <laughs> yeah, it's... You're right, Hezekiah. And, and he, he showed mercy to him. Was it a test? Well, yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's always a test, isn't it? When we're, when we're very sick. It doesn't matter what caused it. Did God specifically go and give him a sickness? Was it uh, something he ate? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. When we're sick, it's always a test. It doesn't matter what the cause is. Did, did, is it my fault? Did I go and uh, drink bad water in Mexico or something? It doesn't matter. When we're, look, when we're staring down the barrel of death, it's always a test. Will this, the test is, will, this, will I allow this to separate me from God? Or will it bring me closer? Will I panic and abandon my faith? Will I betray my faith? Will I blame God? That's the test. Well, did he still die? Yes, he did. Fifteen years later. <laughs> According to what God said. Um, will, we be all, will we always be saved uh, physically when we pray to God? Well, no. 
Oftentimes it's delayed though, but we're still mortal. How many people have you seen to have their prayers answered for healing? I've seen lots, dozens and dozens, where you just go, ah, we don't have any more answers. We prayed first, in the middle and at the end, and uh, nothing's, let's pray some more. I've seen it happen. It's often delayed. Hopefully we use that 15 years or that whatever time it is to great advantage for God. But we're still mortal. So, should we set our house in order anyway? Yeah, we should. That, that's something we can get out of this. Um, yes, we're, we're blessed to have an opportunity to examine ourselves. And if we get well, uh, we can put it to use. <laughs> If we make promises to God, if we make vows, better keep them. If you say, God, if I live, I'm going to do this, this, and this. Well, that's pretty serious, isn't it? Um, keep your promises. We're blessed to have a chance to make things right, to be ready to go, to even realize and finally admit to ourselves, you know, I've been sinning. I need to stop and, and do something different. You know, this is vitally important to our lives. You need to read your Bible. You ever heard that? <laughs> you need to understand it. To, you need to take the trouble to find out what it means. Comprehend it and apply it. And with no further, just like Hezekiah, with no further revelation than what you read in the book, be a, a, take action. Be assured of its trustworthiness to the point that you will take radical action and purify your faith. Get, get in step with God. Um, you know, it's kind of radical to purify your faith. To say, you know, um, somehow, I don't know how, maybe it's the stuff I've been reading or, or what I hear on the radio or whatever, but somehow Calvinism has crept into my life. Somehow I started buying this concept of original sin. Babies are wicked. They're born in sin. No, they're not. That's a lie of Satan. You know that? If you understand what sin is, sin is either violating something God told you not to do or failing to do the things that God told you you should do. To him who knows the right thing to do and does not do it is sin. And all sin is lawlessness. When we, when we understand the law and we break it, yeah, that's sin. Do babies have sin? No, they do not. But somehow that's creeping into the church, isn't it? Here and there. Uh, it's, it's pretty radical when we say it. When we just look something in the face and say, you know, this isn't biblical. Yeah, we have a great history. Um, a few generations removed, but something that's called the Restoration Movement happened because some people stood up and said, you know what we're doing? <laughs> it's not in the Bible. <laughs> and this is preachers standing up in front of their congregations and saying, you know, I was taught that in seminary, but I can't find it. Let's stop doing it. Let's start doing what God says. Yeah, and, and there's just many examples of that. When you get this concept, where did I get it? Well, you know, all roads lead to heaven. Wait a minute, that's a pagan concept, isn't it? That wheel, you know, and, and doesn't matter which road you take, they all lead to heaven. No, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father by, except through me. Okay, so all roads must lead through Jesus in order to get to heaven. That's what the Bible says. When will we stop trying to make everybody all okay now, all creation, instead of preaching the good news to all creation so they can believe it and they can get to heaven? See, that's not, we don't have the right to, to, to say everybody's okay. That's not what Jesus sent the apostles to do, is it? He sent them to preach good news. There is a way. His name is Jesus. Okay. These are pretty radical. Sometimes when we understand, our, somehow our faith has become a little tainted. 
Let's, let, let's get back to the Bible. You know, we need to encounter the enemy. This is not, uh, uh, this is not about arguing with people about religion now. I'm talking about dragging people out of the fire. That's how Jude puts it. To intervene in things like what I call the American Holocaust as parents kill their babies every day. In our, are we doing anything about it? Do we say, oh, that's terrible. Is that all we say? What are we doing about it? What are we getting involved in? I don't mean blowing up abortion clinics. I mean getting involved with people so they know, oh, uh, I'm a single mom. I need help. I can do this. I can bring up a child with some help from my friends. Okay? You know, to rescue the kids that are abandoned because of selfish decisions by their parents. Boy, that was excellent, what we heard a couple weeks ago from our brother Hank Lawson. Really timely information. There's some people doing some things about it. We can get involved in that. We can support it. We can pray for it. Or some other equally effective ministry. You know, we can grab the hand of our friends. When you see, you look in their eyes and you see they're so hopeless that they're retreating into the fog of drug use. And, you know, and... and I'm going to make it through my days by, by drinking. I'm going to drink enough where I can't remember these problems anymore. We need to grab the hands of our friends. Even the ones who are saying, uh, I don't think it's worth living anymore. I think I'm going to commit suicide. Is that real? Oh, yeah, it's real. It's happening. We need to grab a hold of people and, and drag them out of the fire. What are we waiting for, anyway? We've already been called. <laughs> Are we waiting for God to call us to do these things? We've already been called. We've already been commissioned. We've already seen signs. Are you looking for a sign? Jesus did all the signs that are necessary. Even he said, I'll give you one more, the sign of Jonah. Jonah was in the, in the earth, in the ocean, in the whale, three days. I'm going to be in the grave three days and I'm going to rise again. There's no greater sign than that. I have the power over life and death. Do you need anything else? Do we really... Uh, what else do we need before we'll step forward and, and encounter the enemy and do battle? No, we need to bring it to God. Let's not be shocked when we meet a nasty reaction to living for God. Yeah, you can say, well, you know, the Constitution, we have guaranteed life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Don't be shocked when we get a nasty reaction, when we get some violent opposition. Instead of backing off and saying, oh, I'm sorry I offended you. Is that the right thing? That's a Hezekiah move, isn't it? That's the only thing he did wrong. Oh, I have done wrong, he said. No, he hadn't. Don't apologize for Jesus. Instead, we need to go to God and say, did you hear that, Lord? Did you hear what they're saying to me? They're going to put me in jail. Somebody says they might kill me. What are you going to do, God? They're saying I'm brainwashing my kids with fairy stories and legends when I'm telling them about Jesus Christ. That's child abuse. You think that's very far off? Think again. God, thwart their wicked plans. Adjust their attitudes. Help them see the truth. You know, this, ha this is true in many countries. Oh, you can go to church all you want, but no proselytizing. <laughs> that means don't talk to anybody else. You can have your own private little thing, but you can't talk to anybody else about it. God, help me preach the word. When it's in season, when it's out of season. When it's the big rage, you know, like it was back in the 70s, the Jesus movement. Wow, that's great. Everybody's doing it. 
or if it's illegal or despised by the people around them. You know, sometimes we think, well, you know, I think we have enough numbers, we can just we can just fight back. We can make people do right. That's the force option. Is that what God wants to do? No, He wants us to take the threats to Him and lay it at His feet and let Him deal with it. There was a time in the, I, I guess it was in the 80s, this movement when folks wanted to push back and force people politically to behave like Christians and act, act godly. You know, that didn't work. It doesn't today. You know, hearts and lives can only be changed when individuals <coughs> hear about Jesus and they make a personal decision. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to follow him. That's, that's, that's going to be my lifestyle. I'm going to live like that. Laws can't do it. Politics can't do it. They can't accomplish that. Only faith in Jesus. And now we, we get really personal here, right up in your kitchen. And this is something that Hezekiah can help with. It's one of the biggest battles of all. Battling illness and the trial of, of dying. Is it usually before our time? <laughs> you know, we say that about people. Oh, he died before his time. It seems like it, doesn't it? But do you, when is your time, Silas? When is your, when, when is your time, Donna? Do we know that? We have no idea. We say that because, you know, in my mind, you should live to be 70.6 years. That's the average, right, or whatever it may be. Do you know your time? No, you don't. It's no matter. When you're faced with a serious illness and you find yourself saying, I don't know, this might be the one that gets me. I don't know. What will you do? What well, we need to do what Hezekiah did. Go to God first. And take it to God. You know, there's something great in the book of Genesis. Some bad things happened with Cain and Abel and Seth was born. The, the next son, and it says, around this time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. That's very significant. What about in your life? What about in my life? Around this time, I remember, I started, I started going to God first. It's amazing what he's done since that day. You know, the prophet didn't get out the front door <laughs> before God sent the answer. You know, with, with the army, it took, it took until nightfall, okay? This time, he prayed, and, and he, was, he was only out to the, the antechamber, and God said, whoop, hold on, go back. Um, I got a message for Hezekiah. God can take some pretty swift action if we will take it to him instead of trying to fix it ourselves. God is the giver of life. Jesus is called the great physician. Put it in his, in his hands. Yes, set your house in order. Absolutely. Do that anyway. Live like you have 15 days left, not 15 years. What would you do? What would you do if you knew you had 15 days left? Would you get pretty busy? Would you talk to some people? Would you uh, change anything? Oh, probably we would. Well, why not do that then? Why not do it anyway? Set your house in order. We can live with no regrets. We can live for God. We can live for others. We can live with courage. We can live with integrity and say, I'm going to be real from now on. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to set things in order. And what you see is, is what you get. I'm going to be faithful and trust in God. Five things we can learn. We can, we can gather and, and add to our, our arsenal. Thanks to Hezekiah. Appreciate your attention. Thank you very much, John, for that lesson. Um, our closing song is Trust and Obey, number 915 in the Red Book. 
And if you want to stand for this, please. and with our praise. Let us center our entire lives around you and around serving you. And in Jesus' name, amen.